This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Sean Powers and I talk with Adam Jacob, famous for chef and now for system initiative, about a lot of things, but a thread that runs through them is are his discoveries on how to make money. What's the right way to price out value, get value in return for value with open source? How do you take something that's infinite essentially and and not so much charge money for that, but charge for your value and how is that valued? And this is an enduring question in the open source world and he's got some really original takes on it and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is Floss Weekly episode 760, recorded Wednesday, December 6th, 2023. Making money in open source. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Fastmail. Reclaim your privacy, boost productivity, and make email yours with Fastmail. Try it now, free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. Hello again, everyone, everywhere. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week, we are joined by Sean Powers himself, who, for those who are not on the visual channel uh, is more verdant than ever because he's greened up in the top. This is a new signature look. Where, where you, bring you, match, you match the Pac-Man there. thing in the background there too. That's uh, I do. And you know, the Pac-Man thing is one of those things that changes colors. And oh. I, had, I had to like turn the sensitivity down so it wouldn't change. But because when I'm recording video and I like edit and post edit, it drove me nuts that the nice slow shift between the color wheel was like abrupt. If I cut out something and be like, and it drove me nuts. So, so now you have it, you have it fixed on green. Like you have your head fixed on green and pretty much, pretty much. And that's the, that's the, um, one of the bad things that the Pac-Man eats, right? Is that, is that right? In the, in the game, like the, the little, I'm using my hands, like in Pac-Man, right? You have the, you have the, you have the thing that looks like a, a piece of pie, a pie with a piece missing out of it. That's chomping that is down on stuff. Pac-Man. That is Pac-Man. Yes. That is the man. That, 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 that is. The, yes. <laughs> oh, is the, the, the bad thing is the one that's eating. Is that, is that, I, I forget. Oh no. Pac-Man is the one that eats. Well, the- you know, I, and <laughs> our, our guest will explain this to us. <laughs> our guest today is, is Adam Jacob of system initiative. And, um, because I am ill prepared and because you'll do a better job, Adam, <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Well, I mean, technically, it was my job to prepare you. So, uh, yeah, I can uh, I can begin my bio by saying, yes, it is Pac Man that eats the ghost. Yeah, so the ghost, it's off, the ghost, board, who, and then so, they're a little maze, and then they eat the Pac Man eats the little ghost. Only okay. after the power pellet, though. Yeah, Indeed. but, but Pac Man yeah. eats the pellets unless right? you eat the power pellet, at which point you eat the ghost. But if you don't eat the ghost, then the ghosts eat you. Right? Mm-hmm. It's all very. That's right. That's Actually, right. it's unclear what happens. Do the ghosts eat you? I was kind of assumed they ate Pac Man, but I guess it doesn't make sense that they would. They sort of maybe melt him. him, maybe ghosts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they kind of melt him, but I always felt like that was kind of a digestive. Our our our, sort of our, our, our back channel is now sh- has a little video Shouting. running of uh, yeah our, uh, our live participants in Club Twit. So join Club Twit because you can show us Pac Man. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. So I uh, yeah I'm Adam Jacob. I uh, I'm the CEO of a company called System Initiative. Uh, it's an open source company. Um, and then in a previous life, I wrote a thing called Chef that does infrastructure automation that was also open source. Um, and I built that company and co-founded it and then was on the board all the way through its exit. And then in a previous life before that, I was a systems administrator, which is actually really what I am sort of at heart. Um, all of which was, you know, my whole career was basically building ISPs and then you know, you could just sort of trace the rise of the internet and that's sort of the rise of my own work. So, you know, it went from like running modems and bulletin boards to like, to getting people on the internet, to running applications and all of those things, all of which was built on open source software. I was, I was one of the first six Red Hat certified engineers. It was me and a bunch of people wow. from IBM, you know? So like, so, so yeah, so open source and, goes And you are, we, we learned earlier before we were on the air, um, if this is air, this may be something else, but we're on this, <laughs> we're on the bits uh, that you're actually, you live in Marin in, uh, in, yeah. In, yeah. I live in San Francisco. Well, I don't live in San Francisco. Four and five. You live in like four across five, the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. yeah. So, 
So the ISPs you're involved with in the earliest days, are you like with the, well, I was trying to remember the names of some of them, uh, the little something. Uh, well, they were all tiny and I wasn't in San Francisco. Then I was in, I was in outside of Portland. I was in Vancouver, Washington in the beginning. Okay. Uh, okay. Phoenix, Arizona. And like, you know, the one I worked for in Vancouver was like, it, it was literally in the back of a dentist's office. Right. So like you would just walk past people getting their teeth cleaned or whatever to the like corner. They like took one of the like operating bays. I don't know what you call them. It wasn't an operating bay. It makes it sound mm. like they were doing something particularly pernicious in the dentist's office. But, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, there is that ass that's kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah. The, um, the, my first ISP was uh, the one, the first one that worked. The first one didn't work. It was called Netcom or something like that in sure. San Jose. I lived in a, in a, on the peninsula. Um, but the one that it worked was Bat called Batnet, like B A T N E T, and um, they had a bunch of old sun machines. Basically, that's yeah. what they got, and they just totally. ran a bunch of sun machines. Yeah, yeah, it was a bunch of old. Yeah, you get a whole bunch of like smart a, a modem rack, whatever. and you know they had fifty yeah. modems or whatever many customers they could handle at one time, and mm -hmm. and that and yeah. It worked pretty well for, I don't know whatever happened to them. Probably the same thing happened to everybody. Oh, I mean, they got consolidated. So it happened to everybody. So like, yeah, you know, what happened is they got bought into regional ISPs and then regional ISPs got rolled up into a couple of huge ones. And then they all wound up Comcast and at and so, Right. It yeah. was an interesting time to be a, a tech nerd then because it wasn't like you could go and get training on running those. I mean, my, my first real IT job was uh, the no. tech support and, and managing a, a big dial up thing. It was at a college. And, you know, I just got this job because I knew what Unix was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that was, was it. That was yeah. the only requirement. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, do, you, do you know what these words mean and yeah. can do things? <laughs> so like, I, you know, I've been running bulletin boards since I was nine. And so wow. like, I was, I was like particularly poised, you know, they were like, Hey, do you know how to use modems? And I was like, yes. Yeah. Yes. They, I know how to like, I, what's that? It's a modem. You're hired. <laughs> I got you, you know? And like, you know, yeah, I think, and, and in open source, like, that's how everyone, like no one knew how to run those things because no one had ever run them before. Yeah. And like, you know, it's, it was the same thing for, you know, as we got more and more people on the internet, they needed stuff to do. And like, no one had ever done things on the internet before. So we had to figure out how to do that. And then we, you know, like each of those stages, we, we had to figure out together how to do it. And, yep. you know, that, I, don't know how, I don't know how old you are, but I was, uh, like I went to Michigan. okay, I'm, uh, I'm 48, so a little older, but I was at uh, Michigan tech and you know, the only computer classes were like C++ programming or whatever. Totally. And so I, I ended up skipping all of those and all my engineering classes to hang out in the lab to learn networking because there was nowhere to learn networking other than right. figuring it out in the lab. And so, yeah. Yeah, that was it. And like, I think one of the things that I see now sort of in open source and in, and, and in the sort of in the movement is that there is, there's a, there's a thing that happened in that era and, and that we all sort of lived through where, the part of open source that allowed you to to learn the part that allowed you to like not only like see the source but then to build with that source like those isps existed because we could build on top of the things that we saw and if we couldn't have built on top of it we couldn't have built them like that it wouldn't have happened um and the the that i think is a thing that it's not that we've lost it it's just that we won so much and it was so effective and it was so efficient that now we're sort of in this mo we're in a moment where i think people have a little forgotten that like, that's actually a requirement. Like, you know, like it's won so much and it's been so effective that we've sort of forgotten that that was a prerequisite of the whole thing happening. And that, it, and that if you removed it, suddenly you would actually remove this really important part of the, the load bearing part of the ecosystem. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It was, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but um, it was a weird, weird part of history to live through. Awesome. But also strange. Yeah, so fun, but like completely gone and never will be repeated. Yeah. So it, it's sort of like, um, I thought of it at the time and I, I, I was a journalist covering this stuff, basically. I mean, I, I was not, the only code I know is Morse. So that's how yeah. old I am. Um, but the, it, what it looked like to me, especially with, with, with suddenly ISP is using Unix, mm. but before that, even with Linux, it was like Unix escaped like the big animal zoo and they were out running in the wild and anybody could tame them and ri ride them. So it's sort of the way I think the Native Americans felt when the Spanish lost their horses. It's like, we can use these, you know, and yeah. Yeah. And, and suddenly everybody, anybody or everybody could, could not only, you know, program stuff, but they're doing it for themselves. They're not doing it for the, 
for the big company or the yeah. university or whatever, or even within the university, you, you had this ad hockiness going on. And so, so I'm wondering if we could trace from that, you know, through your, your chef period to what you're doing now. Yeah. How, what's changed over that time? Cause you say it will never be there again. And I kind yeah. of feel like we are there a little bit again with AI, but in a very, very, very different way. Yeah. But a super different way. Um, yeah. you know, in before that, you answer, can I, can I interject one just to frame my whole hearing of you? Are you the person responsible for all the puns in chef? Yes. Mo okay. Not all of them, but okay. like I was certainly responsible for the, like, I was responsible for the original puns in that okay. not that, and like chef had a lot of, of, <laughs> of people involved in its creation, both at the time of its creation, but also sort of as the community grew and like all of those people really embraced the mild level of silliness that existed within chef. So like, okay, cool. but like, I'm the one who put the, like, like I called Oh hi, Oh hi. Cause of the ceiling cat, <laughs> you know, like the little cats that would pop up yep, and be like, yep. Oh hi, uh -huh. you know? Cause like sure. what it did was like pop up and tell you stuff about your system. And I thought it was super funny and you know, we shipped it and then, some famous people on Twitter were like, I will never use this software. I had a, it has secret flag where if you sort of added a command line flag, it would go get a lol cat and then translate it into ASCII art and just embed it in the output of Ohi. Um, oh, that makes me sad. Was, I didn't know that I, I did a lot of training on chef and uh, I, that would have been a great addition to my. Well, it got removed within a couple of weeks because it caused oh. quite the kerfuffle. There were people like, I will never run enterprise software that in, injects lol cats. And I was like, you <laughs> people are no fun, you know, like just don't maybe don't run the secret flag anyway. <laughs> yes. So a lot of that was, was me. Uh, okay. Is this, but not is this shift.io just so I, I, mm -hmm. I, I guess I thought, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You'd, I mean, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was cooking. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, well, yeah. it's hard to avoid that or the, or the, you know, or the, uh, the, 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 the book or the TV show or the movie. Oh, the movie. Something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a good movie. Um, but yeah, I think to answer your question of how it's changed, it's um, it's changed. It, I mean, the first way it changed was that it super worked. So my experience of open source uh, living through it and then building up to chef was that like was that it had enabled like every shape of my career up to that point. So, you know, I was like I, I moved to Phoenix ostensibly to go to college as in college for like an hour because I got, I got a job that was paying more than the average degree graduate because I knew how to build ISPs. I knew how to like, I knew how to do that work. Um, that was because open source existed. Um, you know, we, the, I wound up working for an ISP that was owned by uh, the power company in Arizona. Weird quirk of history because they had, because they had power and, uh, and phone lines in parts and of the lines uh, there. That nobody did. So like we brought like we brought internet access to a lot of parts of Arizona that didn't have phone lines. Um, um they didn't have telephones, but they had internet access. Um so like very weird kind of strange moment in history. But you know, that wound up running a bunch of Red Hat servers because we didn't have the cash to wreck to get Solaris boxes, which was all the grown-ups were doing. And so we just ran, we just like assembled PCs and we ran the ISP on PCs and racks and like ran Red Hat. Um, and being able to, you know, look at the software and patch it throughout its life cycle. And then later on, you know, we wound up building, you know, as my career progressed, you know, we were building applications, we were consolidating stuff. I was a systems administrator. I was very rarely like with the teams that were building the applications. So, you know, somebody else would build it. Our job was to understand it and to run it and to figure out how to sort of make those things scale. And all of that work was work that required understanding, you know, how does the system work? How's the kernel work? How does the how do the programming languages work? How is it written? How do you build new automation? And like, and you know, then you had companies start to appear. Red Hat, obviously, in the open source company world, but like, you know, if people remember like Zimian and like the original GNOME folks, you know, Nat and Miguel de Acaza and those people, like, you know, I remember when they raised money and we were all like, oh my God, you can like, you can raise venture capital to to do open source you know and uh and when as we got bigger and as my career progressed like it was all open source all the time because that was what was necessary to sort of get you where you needed to go um and chef you know was an outcrop of that right it was an outcrop of of the fact that we had been building these tools and we've been working in the open in this way and 
and it was sort of a natural thing that it should be open source. But then also that community effect and that ability to to impact people's lives that happened primarily because it's open source. Like if you look at you know Chef and what happened with Chef and sort of how it grew, you know the number one thing that happened was that people took Chef and used it to improve their own lives. Right? They used it to 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 do consulting and training. They used it to to make their day job better. They used it in all kinds of ways that we didn't necessarily predict. Um, and it became it's became something that belonged to them in a really meaningful way. I think over time, we've for that piece of it has been lessened because the money piece of it has kind of become ascendant. And so if you look at like how we run open source businesses and you look at how we how we think about designing what they are, the more successful they get, the less they tend to care about the part of it that was about people, the part of it that was about the impact they had on their lives. And it starts to be more about product, which makes perfect sense. Um, but I think over the years, how it's really changed is that that everyone in the beginning, you know, if you were if you were doing this work in 1996, there was there was probably open source in your life in a way that made more sense than you know you're there's definitely more open source in your life now than there was in 1996 and the dynamics are less clear because they're so powerful and they're so in the water that you just don't you don't really have to think about them to get the benefit does that make sense yeah it's kind of become ubiquitous um so i'm a little more curious because it it seems like your your background is similar to mine uh heavier in system administration uh maybe networking all that sort of and not so much development is that fair I mean, it's fair, but like, uh, I, I, like, it became about development very quickly because well, a lot of the systems. My question, you know, I mean, how did yeah. it come about then? Because Chef is very developer centric, and that was one of my. I mean, personally, that was one of my personal struggles. I it was the first major DevOps tool that I had to uh, yeah. train on, and like train others to use, and it was like, yeah. oh, this. I mean, I understand why Ruby. That was kind of yeah. like a gem uh, of the time, and so um, yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, something like Ansible kind of yeah. spoke to my inner system administrator better. It wasn't, yeah. you know, came out a little later, but um, yeah. so was that, that was an intentional, like we have to really focus on development to make this well, accessible. Yeah. I mean, I've always kind of believed that the gap there is, is, is kind of false. That if you think about the way people learn and the way that they sort of rise through the technology, it's kind of like you're walking up different sides of a pyramid. And if you like, if you meet a sufficiently advanced systems administrator, they're indistinguishable from an application developer, right? Like the specifics of the wizardry that they can do are different, but the shape in which they do it and the way that they think about problems, like they tend, it tends to converge. Um, and so for me, I had spent a lot of that time creating stuff. I like to build things. I like to create new stuff. I like to think about how systems work. I like to create new systems. I like to, I like to think about the, the, the bigger the shape and the bigger the problem, the more interesting it is to spend time thinking about it and trying to figure out ways to fix it or trying to wait how to build new technology. And I think with Chef, it's, and for my career, like I am a systems administrator, but I wound up having to build all my own tools because the tools that existed were insufficient to the task or they didn't quite fit for the problem. And then the only thing to do is build new tools. And how did I learn to build new tools? Like I learned to build new tools because I looked at the tools I was using, understood how they worked, and then wrote new ones that worked kind of like they did, but were a little different. Like, you know, one lens you can look at my whole career is like Mark Burgess wrote CF Engine 2. And like my ability to look at CF Engine 2 and like Luke Kinese wrote Puppet and my ability to understand how Puppet worked then leads directly to how Chef worked, which then all of that work to understand how Chef worked led to, you know, Habitat and led to a bunch of other tools that I've written. And then that leads to System Initiative. And it's all one sort of unbroken line of both learning and and understanding and hacking. And yeah. yeah for what it's worth, it was a uh, uh, that pyramid example is is pretty profound because, you know, I had to, of course, when you when you teach something, there's no way to learn like the need to teach it. And so I, I had to learn Chef. And the whole time I'm learning, I'm like, do you know how many complicated bash scripts I've written over the years to do this yeah. exact thing? Oh, if I would have been, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, right. it, it makes sense. I was just curious how you got to that point. Yeah, that's how I got there. Cause I like to build things. And then, and then also my, like my people, the people I resonate most with are, are, I recognize like our systems administrators, you know, like 
you know, when I pitched, when I like, I met venture capitalists for the first time, some of them yesterday, right? And we met lots of them. But like, when they asked, they're like, well, who are, like, who are you? What's your background? Like, I'm still the systems administrator, really, right? There's a lot I do that isn't that <laughs> more and more all the time. But like, really, that's who I am. And those are the people that I best know how to serve. That's why I keep building tools for operations and DevOps. And like, that's why that's the space I'm in is because like, it's the space I like. And those are the people I I like. And those are the people I understand. And like, that's the that's what I resonate with. Um, and open source is what allows that to exist in a way that isn't just having a relationship, you know, like, like using Chef wasn't like using Excel, right? Like there was a community of people and they were there and you could talk to them and they would support you. And like, if you ever went to a Chef Conf, you know, like a lot of most of Chef Conf wasn't about us, right? It was actually about everyone who came it was about like what they were doing it was about it was about how they were talking to each other so i'm i'm wondering what the so we haven't gone into a system initiative yet yeah. um and that's your that's your work now um yeah. tell us about your role in that uh, did you start it or you run it what is it a business is it not what's what's yeah, it all about yeah system initiative is basically a um it's an attempt to sort of rebuild DevOps from the ground up. So, and I'm the CEO and I'm co-founded it, um, I think. And really what we're doing is basically looking at the workflow of DevOps and saying that for all the work that we've done, which was fantastic, the outcomes tend to not be as good as we hope. You know, if you actually, especially for the big enterprises, you know, like you, we wanted you to deploy whenever you wanted to. Now you kind of can't, you know, maybe you deploy once every 20, more, you know, once a week once every six months, which look, if you roll the clock back to 2008 and you deployed every week, you're doing a super happy dance, but, uh, but it's not what you wanted. What you wanted was the ability to sort of collaborate together effectively and efficiently and deploy as many times as you needed to sort of whenever you felt like you needed to in a way that was seamless and collaborative. And we didn't really get it. And so system initiatives are attempts to sort of think differently about the workflow and the way that people work and build something fundamentally new to change the way that people do it. So Basically, it gives you a visual interface for doing composition over the top of this like big, complicated hypergraph that allows you to write code to describe how everything behaves. Um, and so it's this programmable machine with a really collaborative real-time interface to work together to build your infrastructure. And it's all open source um, and venture-backed. Um, and so I think, you know, part of it is is the technology is interesting. But another piece that's interesting is that like every line of code is open source. So there's there's no piece of system initiative that isn't open source and there and won't be. Um, so it's the same model that like Red Hat, for example, follows. So I want to get a little further into how having this in the world changes what you put in the world. But first, I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Fastmail. Make email work for you with Fastmail. Customize your workflow with colors, custom swipes, night mode, and more. Fastmail now has quick settings from the quick settings menu. You can easily choose a new theme, switch between light mode and dark mode, and change your text size without leaving the Fastmail screen you're looking at. Quick settings will also offer options related to the Fastmail screen you're viewing, such as generate a new masked email address, show or hide your reading pane, switch between folders and labels and more choose to auto save contacts or choose to show public images from external services like gravatar set default reminders for events change how invitations are handled or turn notifications for calendar alerts on and off now buy or add a domain through fastmail and they will set up all the records for you so it works immediately Fastmail gives you the ability to send and receive emails from your own domain and manage multiple email addresses in one space, which helps keep you organized and protects your personal data. For over 20 years, Fastmail has been a leader in email privacy. The Fastmail team believes in working for customers as people to be cared for, not products to be exploited. Advertisers are left out, putting you at the center. You pay for free email with your privacy at Fastmail. Your data stays yours with better productivity features for as little as $3 a month. Fastmail has better spam filters and absolutely no ads. And privacy isn't all you get with Fastmail. Superior productivity tools with scheduled send, snooze, folders, 
labels, search bar, etc. Plus, keep track of all of the important details in your life easily with Fastmail's powerful sidebar. Works with password managers like Bitwarden and 1Password to make it easy for you to create unique passwords for every account and safely store them on your device. It is great on your desktop and mobile, especially when you download the Fastmail app to get the most out of your email. It's easy to download your old data and import it into your new Fastmail inbox. Fastmail is moving email forward with new internet standards and open source innovations that power many email services other than their own. Don't get left behind by substandard email providers. Reclaim your privacy and boost productivity with Fastmail. Try it now, free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. That's fastmail.com slash twit. So, Adam, um, one of my favorite lines from Marshall McLuhan is we may we shape our tools and our tools shape us. And mm -hmm. uh, we do things differently with our smartphone than we did with a landline. Right. I mean, yes, of these things all changes. So you've got you've kind of done this twice, first with Chef and now with this. Mm -hmm. How is it changing the actual output, what people are actually doing with DevOps? Yeah. So, I mean, that's I love that quote, too. Um, you know, one of the things with with the DevOps world that uh, happened very quickly was we sort of bifurcated ourselves into two lanes. There was the culture lane that was like, hey, it's 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 not so much about the tools you choose because you've got lots of choices. It's more about that culturally you sort of understand that these are the people parts to do. I think we kind of missed the second part, which is that, you know, culture is actually what you do, not what you say. And so you know, the shape of our tools are the shape of our culture, right? The way we do the work is that is, in fact, what we mean when we say, like, what is your what is your culture? So, you know, part of what brought me to system initiative and also why I, I sort of love open source more broadly is that that intersection of if we want to change the way people work, if we want an order of magnitude, different or better outcome, we have to have an order of magnitude change in the way that people work, like in the literal thing that they do. So a good example there is right now, um, when you sit down to think about how you manage your infrastructure, you probably reach for Terraform or Pulumi or the CDK, right? Um, maybe you don't, maybe you use the web consoles, but like for a lot of folks, they would say the right answer there is like infrastructure as code. Um, and we kind of know what the outcomes are if you use infrastructure as code. like. Uh, it's kind of great. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And also it gets kind of unwieldy and difficult, especially at large scale. Um, and so you wind up with a set of experts who understand sort of not only what the cloud providers are doing, but also how to manage the shape of the infrastructure as code code base, which itself becomes a huge code base that needs to be managed. So part of what we think about is like, if I want to change how that functions, I have to think differently about how I represent even the information, right? So, you know, we build visual interfaces that uh, that are built on top of digital twins. So we're doing like one-to-one -one modeling of your infrastructure assets and then letting you build like simulations on top of them. But to your Marshall McLuhan quote, like the reason that works is because it lets us change the feedback loop so that, you know, when you design something in system initiative, we're qualifying it all the time in real time according to your changes so we can tell you immediately like hey you fat fingered the name of that docker image and suddenly what you get is like mm -hmm. an immediate feedback loop that's like shows you that the configurations turned red we can only do that because we have a big model of what's possible and what good inputs are and what what bad ones are and we can tell you what works and what doesn't that's you know that's not a thing you can do if you let the tools stay in the shape that they're in right and and it's that that's that's sort of how system initiative thinks about it but it's i think broadly applicable to 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 lots of different things like so, when you're thinking about being creative you have to think differently about the rules a little and so does it, it does it go on top of existing types of things or i mean is this like another layer that uh, manages things beneath or is this yeah. kind of a replacement abstraction of the it's things it's kind or? of a replacement it's okay. not kind of it is a replacement so like yeah, we basically fundamentally changed the shape of how it sits at the bottom. So like instead of what's sitting at the bottom being source code, what sits at the bottom is this really high fidelity model that's backed by this by a by a hypergraph of functions. Um, and then on top of that, we can then generate things like code 
we can then generate things. We can do all kinds of stuff on top of that model. But at the at the root, it's not. It's no longer code. It's actually like an active data model you can program. So is there a migration process from doing something another way, or is it a? a yeah. So how would you know, start using your your product? Yeah, it's like very on. early days with System Initiative. So like today. Okay. The only people who should be using system initiative are people who are super nerdy about the space. Like if you're not very deep and nerdy, like it's not ready for you yet. Just so we're clear. Okay. Um, but if you are like the way it works is that we've we separate out the the tracking of state. So if you think about how infrastructure as code works now, where there's like a state tracking thing that does in the middle. So you write your code, then you have some state and then you have the actual cloud provider's state and you synchronize them. What we do is break them apart and we track them both separately. So you can actually go in the end, you'll be able to go from the final state of something running and we can inspect that and build the model backwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if, in the end, that's how you're going to get, that's how you'll do it today. You okay. have to go the other way, but, um, yeah. Okay. So the, the goal is eventually to have like migration paths kind of thing, but now mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, help us make it worth migrating to is that <laughs> yeah i mean now it's basically look our ambition is to be an order of magnitude better than the existing tool chain and like that's an incredibly hard ambition like sure. i'm not i'm i got plenty of ego or whatever but like but i'm not so egotistical as to think i can just sort of do that in a single throw so um so yeah our focus is really on like let's build the technology that does get us that outcome and then and and we'll build that up with the next to the people that we know will care and that we will understand why it's valuable. And over time, that will that will turn into something everyone can use. OK. Yeah, so so I'm wondering here, um, I'm looking around on your website and hmm. um, and I'm wondering how, how your own team works. You're distributed, I guess, all over the place. Is that yeah. is that right? Are you mostly yeah. US? You no, we're all distributed. Product. We have people all over the United States, Brazil, the UK, uh, Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, we have a person who's going to be in Australia here in a hot minute. Mm -hmm. How many? Uh, how many people overall in the in the in your community? Uh, well, in the community, there's thousands. Um, mm. uh, or there's a, there's about a thousand ish people in the Discord right now, um, and then you know the company has eighteen people. Um, yeah, so um, you were first here. We got you from the uh, the enterprise show because you started. Yeah. yeah, and that's uh, I think Ant poached you from there, saying, "Oh, this guy's great. We got to have him over on our show." Um, you've had a a window on the enterprise for some time now. What it, what changes are you seeing in in how it works? I'm I'm especially interested in whether or not at all the fact that a company is using open source changes that company. Yeah. I mean, look, using open source absolutely fundamentally changes how companies work. I think I think there's a couple of related things happening all at once. So, you know, when we talk about open source and we talk about companies, both the companies that build open source and sell it for money, and then also the the companies who consume open source, in general, large enterprises are consuming open source as products, right? So a mm -hmm. good example here is like Red Hat makes OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift is essentially their Kubernetes distribution. It's got a couple of other pieces tied together to it, but that's really what it is. Red Hat's making over a billion dollars a year in ARR, so which is insane. So in case you're whatever, not a business nerd, a billion dollars a year in ARR is ridiculous. It's basically double HashiCorp's revenue completely, right? Um, which is nuts. So, uh, and they sell that to the large enterprise. And, you know, they didn't build Kubernetes. You can get it from other vendors. You can get it from, there's all kinds of places you can get it from, but lots of large enterprises buy it from Red Hat because they like the shape of that product. They want it to be supported. They want to understand the supply chain. There's a million reasons why it's valuable to them to acquire that software as product from Red Hat. Um, what then happens inside those organizations is that people like me, people like Sean, like we wind up working inside those large enterprises and our ability to see the source code, to understand how the system works, then allows us to better both support the enterprise and the work that they do, but also to then collaborate with our vendors in changing how the solution works, right? Um, and that kind of 
symbiotic relationship doesn't really exist outside of open source relationships with your vendors, right? If I, if I have a vendor and, uh, you know, if I use, I'll use Honeycomb because they're my friends, none of it's open source. If I need a new feature in Honeycomb, I got to go call my friends at Honeycomb and I got to be like, please, um, OpenShift in theory, I could, I could do it. I could, I could be like, let me show you what I mean. Like, let me, let me, let me push this thing through together alongside you. Right. Um, and that, that is a transformative way of working with a vendor. Um, and it changes both the expectations of, of what a large enterprise thinks they should be getting out of their relationships with their vendors. Um, it also changes the way that the company thinks about their relationship with their customers. Right. Um, it's it's the difference between how people feel about like what's your relationship with Microsoft when you use Excel? Yeah. You know, like yeah. the answer is you don't have one. <laughs> you're like, you're pleased yeah. that Excel exists, like you're glad that it works, but you don't have a relationship. Um, and and no matter how much you love Excel, it's pretty difficult for it to grow into a relationship with Microsoft rooted in your ability. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's just similar, at least with Microsoft, you might be paying them, but with Google. You know, I mean, we're using a Google document here uh, to, yeah. to organize the show. I, I I don't think any of us has any sense that we're going to influence Google in any way. No, you're going to have no yeah. relationship with Google, right? None. And so they don't want one. It's they go out of their way to not have one. Yeah, you'll go out of your way not to. Well, and also Google is bad at it. So, but like, <laughs> but sorry, Google. Um, no, but true. you super are. Um, and, and and I think you wind up with this interesting, that impact of open source in the enterprise like it does feedback. What becomes interesting when you look at the software, the open source software itself, and then the companies maybe that build it, is that as you sell into the enterprise, what you realize is that people are buying your product. And there's this long tail of people who don't care about your product. They care about the software. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. they actually, like there's lots of people who care about Kubernetes that don't care about OpenShift. They care about, and and a lot of those people will never buy OpenShift because they don't work in the large enterprise. They don't, they don't need those things. And this is how you wind up with like HashiCorp deciding to change their license, right? Because HashiCorp winds up, you know, they got this huge customer base in the enterprise. They're really attached. They have a relationship with HashiCorp. Maybe they look at the source. Mostly they don't, you know, how many people patch it? Not very many, you know? And so you wind up with these relationships that then tend to look, if you don't, if you're not careful about tending that garden, if you're not thoughtful about how you evolve, you wind up with this huge customer base that's willing to say that that treats the software as product. You know you're selling that product. And then there's this huge set of people who are getting all this value for no money. They're not paying me anything to get that value. They're just getting value out of the software for free. And they start to look wrong because the customers you care about are the ones that pay you. Yeah. So like there's an interesting dynamic in in how we think about open source and how we think about its impact in companies that like that enterprise's ability to have a deeper relationship with the vendor is a glorious, beautiful thing. But as that as those relationships emerge and as people relate mostly to that product, it, it does actually have this really somewhat deleterious effect on the on the long tail. It's interesting. I mean, I uh, just before we're talking here, um, uh, share with our friends here that, you know, we're, we have construction going on outside our house. It's very technical, actually. They've got a thing that there's a guy sitting there looking through an instrument that sees into the ground and sees the, the head of a drill going on in the ground. And, um, and they've got, um, there are seven pieces of excavators and heavy machinery in our backyard. Yeah. Um, I'm out there. I want to know how they work, <laughs> you know, and there's yeah. no secrets about it. I mean, even this thing just looking into the ground, I spent 45 minutes talking to these guys about this. They're happy with it. They like it. I, I suppose there may be some, it, but I'm, what I'm saying about this is that there's an open source part to this in the sense that they don't have any secrets about what they're doing at all. Right. You know, we're paying them to do this excavating and, and stuff right. like that. Um, and learning some of their vernacular is interesting too. Like this, we, the, this is called Salem limestone uh, in, that I'm surrounded by in our basement here. Um, and it's building limestone. It's some of the most important building limestone in the world, actually. It's quarried here. And our backyard is a quarry at the moment. But these guys call it bluestone because that's the color it is when they drill it out of the ground. Right. And it's all known as... And, and so knowing that little bit of vernacular helps, you know, and and I, I feel it's not so much I'm bonding with these guys. I'll hang with them for two or three days and then they're gone. I'll never see them again, probably. But sure. there's a... Knowing how things work 
at, at, a, at a human level as well as a technical level matters. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think that's one of the pieces of what open source brought to business that wasn't there before. You know, you hired Oracle in the past, right? You, yeah. you had a big Oracle database. Did you know how it worked? You didn't, weren't even supposed to know how it worked. It's probably still opaque, but yeah, you know, but Oracle bought Sun and they bought, they yeah. bought into open source to a large degree because they had to. Well, think of it this way. All companies became technology companies. It doesn't matter what your industry was. And it used to be that it wasn't, you know, like now you go talk to the, the guys out front who are drilling the limestone. Like that's an incredible piece of technology they have, right? It's not just yeah. a drill. It's this, it's an incredible it's a smart thing. drill. It's got a $25,000 head on it. That's yeah. Right. And it's got a, it's got yeah. a monofilament camera that's like coming up to the machine and like, they, <laughs> it's incredible what they can do. Right. And when you think about like, they're a technology company, uh, every company is essentially a technology company at this point. And when you look at that, you know, we started this conversation about ISPs and that how interesting that moment of evolution was, you know, that, Evolution was spurred by the fact that we were technology companies. We were inventing a new kind of technology that we were then going to sell that technology to consumers that drove this massive industry that drove this incredible adoption that leads us to be, you know, on a podcast with high fidelity video. It's incredible what's happening right now. And, and that what happens in open source and why it matters in the enterprise, they are also now innovative technology companies. If you ask them, if you go to a bank and you say, where are you innovating? They'll say, well, our, you know, our mobile app is the best. Um, our, like it's the, it's, it's, there's lots of places they're innovating. It's all technology. And how did we, what is open source's place in that? Well, it turns out open source is an incredible engine for innovation in technology companies. <laughs> like it is an incredible yeah. way for people to learn and to work together, but not only to learn, but to build. And to to build things that make sense for them, and that ability to build on top of other people's technology, not just to understand it, but to build on it, is critical to the to that quick delivery of innovation that is now the thing that every company in the world needs. And I think the it's not that you can't innovate on top of closed source software, or that you can't build on top of closed source software. Of course you can, but like, but it's not quite the same. Yeah, and. Yeah. And, and I think that that transition has really happened in the last 15, 20 years that like, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was a risky thing to say you were going to build on top of open source, right? You know, when we started using Red Hat at the ISP, people were like, you can't use Red Hat in production to run an ISP. Like, you got to go buy some Solaris boxes. That's like, that's what the grownups do. And like, but we didn't have to do that. It worked just fine, you know? Um, and it worked, it got better over time. Yeah. There were like rough edges, but we fixed them cause we could. And you sort of, that <laughs> innovation cycle kicks off. And I think that shape in the enterprise is also really true. And so when you think about it in the macro, like that ability to, uh, to, you know, come talk about the jargon, to get into the details, to understand what it is. When you look at the impact on business, it is that, that has spurred that innovation cycle that we all benefit from all the time. And it's such a powerful impact that people don't actually believe it's happening because you can't really measure it. It's not like, it's not like you can measure it the way I can measure a sales pipeline. You know, like you come into my orbit as a marketing qualified lead and then I get you to money at the bottom. Like I can measure that. I can be like, Oh, I'm moving Sean through my pipeline. You know, I'm going to get, mm -hmm. I'm going to get Sean to pay me, but I can't measure the, the impact of the innovation cycle that happened inside pick a giant bank because they decided mm. to adopt chef. I, it happened. They'll tell you it happened. They'll tell you like the human beings can tell you what the impact was, but I can't measure it in an abstract way. And so we wind up in this very interesting thing where there's this incredibly powerful force that if you've experienced it or you've lived it, or you've seen enough to understand how it all attaches, you know that it's there, but it's a little spooky action at a distance still. You can't actually describe like what exactly is it? So, uh, Sean, in keeping with his hair color, uh, which is green, has some money questions, which we'll get to after this break right now. All right. Okay. So, Sean, go for it, man. So, 
I so I, I was sitting here thinking, like remembering back, and I honestly don't remember the uh, how Chef made money. I don't remember what part you paid for if you paid for Chef, <laughs> that's a, which I yeah, may not be a good, good thing for the company. <laughs> I mean, um, look, it's a good question. We made plenty of money. I got no regrets. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm curious. Uh, well, my my question though is, how, how does System Initiative going to make money? I realize it's really early yeah. days, but I mean, there must yeah. be a plan. You don't seem like somebody who would go into this naively no. thinking if you make something money will happen. Yeah. So here's what like is a long cycle and chef. The, the, the answer is chef made money every way that it's possible to make money on open source. We tried, um, you know, we, the initial plan was that we were going to have a hosted SaaS service and the software would be open source. And if you wanted to run it yourself, you could, but you would pay us to run it on a SaaS. We were like ridiculously too early, uh, to do that. The people's appetite to do that was like zero. Really, if you, you were small, you would, but otherwise you just weren't interested in having a hosted configuration management platform. Um, you know, toward the end of Chef's life, 15 years later, everybody was like, where's the hosted version? And it made me want to die because I'm like, oh, I shipped that for you 14 years ago and you didn't care. But, you know, cheers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so then we were selling. Was that shift when things went to the cloud more more red readily, do you think? I mean, when things, when everything was then yeah hosted i mean is that where i mean shift? we built the hosted service as the cloud was coming up so i mean it was okay. a contemporary of like ec2 right okay um but like but it was just too early people just weren't ready and so we sold it on prem and that was a huge problem it was a we ar argued about it a lot so basically we took then we had like an enterprise version that was the same software that we used to run the hosted platform that wasn't open source and if you paid for it you got that version or you got the open source version that eventually sucked for a number of reasons, like the tension with the community, which features are in, which features are out. There were two separate code bases. So then we finally just open sourced it all, uh, open sourced all of the server. And then it was like about premium features. So it was like, oh, we'll build the Chef Automate platform, which sits on top of the core of what Chef does. And that thing will be for enterprises. So it'll have like better role-based access control. It'll have, you know, better auditing. It'll have, you know, compliance reporting and all this stuff inside of it. That's what enterprises really care about, right? And then we'll sell that part for money, but we'll give the chef part away for free. Um, this also filled with shenanigans, right? So like, you know, in any given moment, I'll, here's a story that really highlights the monetization struggle here. So like we were selling to a company that was really very large. Let's call them, you know, fortune, easy fortune 100, right? Probably fortune 50. And year long bake off between chef and its competitors, right? They choose chef. Uh, they send us an email. They go, congratulations. You are the, you know, configuration management vendor for this Fortune 50 company. And uh, and also, you're massive dummies. And we're never going to pay you a dime because everything we actually want from the software, uh, we get for free. So, cheers. Awesome. Uh, they actually said that. They actually said well, that out loud. They actually kind of swore in the email. They, wow. uh, which I can't do because we talked about this earlier in the thing. Yeah. So like, yeah, in the email, they were like, you are, you know, because you were massive dummies. We are. <laughs> they dropped bombs. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh. Yeah, they weren't polite about it. Um, oh. And, you know, so imagine you find yourself on the receiving end of this email and your sales rep is like, Wah! you know, like that's bad. Um, and, you know, that's what it's like to sell open core software because we just, for that customer, for that individual person, what they saw value in was the core thing that Chef did, not all of the enterprise stuff that we had stuffed into this other product. And because that was all the value they needed, you know, they didn't need to pay us. And they didn't, so they didn't. And the Chef that they got from me was 100% identical to the Chef that I got, I gave to my customers. So they were getting all the quality. They were getting all of the supply chain guarantees. They were getting all of the support, all of the care, all of that that my paying customers got. And uh, that was bad. So in the end, we, uh, we changed our business model um, to have 100% of the software be open source. So instead of having some things that were enterprise and some things that weren't, everything was open source. But if you wanted Chef, Chef brand Chef, uh, you could only get it from me under commercial terms. So you could take the software and do whatever you'd like with it. It was all under the Apache license. Feel free. What you didn't get was my brand. And the assets that we produced at Chef 
So if you wanted the chef client or you wanted any of those things, the only way to get them was to be a customer of chef. You had to pay them Um, or at least accept that you had to get it under commercial terms. Uh, We made that move. And that same customer who sent us that email came back to us and was like, congratulations, here's the check. Because the alternative suddenly was getting chef the software uh, from someone else. And in this case, there was a fork. It was called Sync. I'm so pleased that that fork exists. I'm, and I love the people who make it and maintain it to this day. They're fabulous human beings. But the question now for that Fortune 100 organization was not, do I pay chef for chef? The question was, do I get chef from the people who make chef or do I get chef from the Sync people? whoever they are, <laughs> under whatever terms they do it and whatever way they package it up and whatever way they distribute it. This was better for us as a company. Um, it was a significant mover of our revenue. Um, it really made a huge difference. And so that model is roughly equivalent to how Red Hat works today. Um, it has always worked. Um, and it turns out that model is fantastic. Um, it aligns the community to uh to the company because the software is free and if you want to collaborate on the software together for whatever ends you want to collaborate on it with us feel like let's do that together Um, if you want to build a business that competes with system initiative or with chef you can um you'll probably i don't know that you'll be better than us at it but you might you know like in and god bless you you should be able to um and and but if you also just want to consume that as a product, you can. And the way you do that is paying for it. We have we have some questions queuing up here, but first <laughs> on our back channel. But first, I'll take our last break. Here we go. All right. OK, so, Sean. Yeah. So it's funny while you were describing that uh, me and and Jonathan and our one of the other co-hosts in the back were Orwell saying, so basically you're describing Red Hat and CentOS and then you finished up the segment referencing Red Hat. So yes, we're all on the same page. Yeah, we're all on um, the same page. How things work there. Uh, my, yeah. my question though is, so it sounds like you are set up perfectly to understand all of the pitfalls and nuances of trying to pay your mortgage mm-hmm. while working in the open source world. So how how is a uh, system initiative now handling that? I mean, the exact the, that exact model that we discovered. The last end. iteration. So that, okay. I have to tell you, like that journey, I wrote a whole thing. There's a website. It's sfosc.org, sustainable, free and open source communities. Like I, I wrote like it's it's not a book, but it's like longer than an essay, <laughs> you know, um, sort of. Like I had a whole like long dark night of the soul trying to figure out like, why is there this tension between the open source community that I loved and our business's ability to be sustainable and to, and to, and to thrive. I'm like, why are those two things in tension? And I disliked that tension so much that I was never going to be in open source again, other than as a creator, I was never going to start a business that was open source. Um, but having, but eventually I did figure out sort of how to resolve that tension. Um, and so. I think, yeah, the 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 way that that works for system initiative is identical. Like we every all the software we build is open source. All of it. You can take it. What you can't do is build system initiative. You got to call it Sean Powers. Right. Um, And build your own version of it and do what you want to do with it. And Sean Powers has to figure out how to build and support and run that thing and whatever it is you need to do. Um, But if you want to collaborate with me on the software, if you're like, hey, I want to add this feature to this thing we both love and care about, I'm going to work with you all day, every day, twice on Sunday, right? Because um, that's fantastic and it serves us both. Um, yeah. Has the has the recent, and I mean, I'm not going to get too far in the weeds here, but the the recent Red Hat sent to us kerfluffle, is that, uh, is that a cautionary tale to you? How does that affect how you're doing things, how you think about things or? Yeah, I mean, look, these things are always fragile. Mm -hmm. And, and I think what with Red Hat and CentOS in particular, there's always this ebb and flow of, you know, even, even when you can align the incentives as well as Red Hat has, which let's be honest, it's fantastic how what they, that they have been able to do that as long as they have in the way that they have. And, uh, I bet it hurts to, you know, have a round of layoffs, um, and watch your friends go home. And at the same time, have people who what they do is take the software that you put a bunch of money and effort into, repackage it, sell it for money. And and, you know, meanwhile, your friends are getting laid off. 
That's not the greatest feeling you've ever had in your life. And so it's unsurprising to me that in those circumstances, they reacted by trying to figure out how they could put more differentiation between their commercial product and someone else's commercial product that is roughly equivalent, but that they tend to sell for less. Right. Um, and I don't know that in, in that the cautionary tale to have there is that you have to just stay open to the true value of the open source part of what you're doing here, which is that that software raises everyone up that that software creates the opportunity for people to create what they need to create. And, and it's easy to close your heart and to turn that into a competitive game where it's zero sum, but it doesn't have to be zero sum, right? The, the reality is every person who decides to buy Oracle Linux is an easier sell for Red Hat than somebody who decides to use Ubuntu. Right. Um, like, and and that, you know, so the market gets bigger. That's better for Red Hat. Does it suck that you lose those deals? Yes. Does it particularly suck when your friends are getting laid off and they were the maintainers of some of that software and now they don't have jobs? Yes. So the cautionary tale there is that even in the dark moments when it's really difficult to maintain that footing, you you just can't you just can't give up on that truth that it is better for everyone that we work together and that we collaborate. Um, and that sometimes that collaboration is easy and sometimes it's hard, but, uh, but that openness is the point from a business model point of view, it changes nothing, which is the most efficient way to monetize open source in most circumstances. So here are the qualifications there. It's not always the right way, but it, frequently I think it is, is actually to say what we do is build a product and we sell it for money. Full stop. Um, which is what they do. And I think that's the best way. Have you, you said that the community is like thousands of users. Have you mm. found the community around system initiative to be um, uh, pretty uh, open and, and willing to uh, talk about and discuss those kind of tough, tough things, you know, like, or the, you know, the potential nobody's the using future? it in production yet. Okay. So it's a little all fun and games, <laughs> you know, like, like, and I'm not charging anyone money for it. So it's not like somebody who wants to try system initiative right now has to be like, oh, am I going to pay Adam $5 for the privilege of giving it a shot? You know, like if I was, we'd be having more conversations about it, you know, <laughs> um, I think. Uh, but yeah, the conversations we have had, um, you know, have tended to be with people who are quite philosophical about the space. They're people who are pretty deep in open source and they're pretty deep in the history of it. And they want to know, like, how are you going to monetize this software? You know, are you going to rug pull me eventually? You know, are you eventually going to close this off? Um, Because that's an awful feeling, right? If you've put time and effort, you know, um, I think Kelsey Hightower said this about HashiCorp and I kind of felt the same. Like, you know, whether he'd contributed a line of code to it or not, he had spent a significant amount of his time talking about it and going out in the world, evangelizing it as a thing people should use and, and they should learn and they should grow on top of. And suddenly what he was doing was being a corporate shill for proprietary software. And I don't think he'd have done that if it hadn't turned out that way. And so, you know, people are really worried about that shape. And so we've had a lot of conversations about the, well, are you going to rug pull me? You know, uh, what's the, what's the capabilities here? I think, you know, our answer to that question is we're not. And uh, the software is all open source. You can always take it and do what you want to do. You can relicense it if you wanted to. You could do whatever you needed to do without us. Um, okay. And, and I, I appreciate that your website now, even though it's early days and you're not charging, I mean, the pricing model is, is very clearly put up there. It's, it's not like you're, you know, the drug dealer trying to get everybody hooked on your product and then say, all right, now is the day, you know, no, I'm being really clear that I'm, yeah, that's, it's right there yeah, right my, now. So what, what I do is I build an incredible product that I want to sell to you for money. That's why I'm building open source software. That's what I want to do. Um, I also want to build a giant open source community. I also want you to be able to take that and do what you want to do with it. I want that too. Um, and those two things don't have to be in tension with each other. Um, but it does mean I have to say it out loud. If I don't say out loud, look, I'm going to monetize this thing. You're going to like, if you consume system initiative from me, you're using this, you're using my product and you're going to have to accept it on my commercial terms. And if you don't want to, that's okay. Um, there will definitely be a fork of system initiative. I can't, and I'm stoked for it. As soon as that fork arrives, it's because there's enough value there and people love it enough that they're that they don't that they're unwilling to take it on my terms. That sounds great. 
like what that means is there's a much bigger community of people who care about that software and care about that value. It's only going to make it better over time. It's interesting to me that what you're selling is the value of yourself and not just of the code because they get, otherwise it's available for free anyway. Right. You're anybody can have yeah. it. I and mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it, it's like the, your customers value you and what you bring to the table that is original. And even if the, the goods themselves are, are duplicable or other, you know, other people can use them in any other way they want, um, that it's yours. I mean, it's personal. I mean, it's an interesting aspect of it that. Well, but if you think about it, right, like if most in, software engineers tend to be the people who have the most trouble understanding this because what they value is the software because they know how to write software. They know how to run it. Right. They're like, I don't need you. Companies, other regular human beings in the world yeah. back to take it back to your limestone drillers. If they just rolled up with all the gear and dropped it off and were like, Doc, have a party. <laughs> drill yeah right <laughs> you know that's not better right you need a product and the product they're selling you is i'm going to show up with the gear and the expertise and i know how to make this happen and i will drill it for you and it will work in the end you don't want the software you don't want the drill you want the homies who run the drill right yeah, yeah. um and the same thing is true when we sell software products like i got an iphone right here if you gave me all the software and all the specs to build an iphone i don't want to build an iphone i just want to buy a freaking iphone like, I just want to move on with my life. Like, I just don't, I don't need, I don't need to exist in that level. And what's great about this model and what's great about open source is that we get to exist on both levels. You get to say, look, there is, there's a community of people who get value from the software as software. The value they get of it is how they, is that they can explore it, is that they can change it, is that they can collaborate with us. It is that they can build their own things on top of it. It is that they can take it out and do what they want to do with it. That's fantastic. Those people are never my customers, right? They don't want, they're not getting value from the, from the product. They're getting value from the software. Fantastic. Get value from the software. Lots of other people, they need to get value out of it as a product. And what we do is sell products to those people that are incredible. Um, and we, and like, it's, it's actually really straightforward. It's fascinating to me that as an industry, we have wound up building the open core model as the de facto answer to monetization and open source. Because if you actually describe what I just described to you, I think is pretty straightforward. The open core model says, build something of incredible value. Chef. Nine, you have to give away 99% of what makes Chef valuable. All of it, if you want to be honest, right? So like you could build some of the biggest companies in the world on top of Chef and not pay a dime for 15 years of it. Um, and we did that because there were also people who valued the software. <laughs> right? And because those people who had the software needed it to do that way, we also hamstrung our monetization and wound up building this incredibly Byzantine mechanism to talk about what what real what uh, what they'll really value. Um, it's it's insane that that's how we landed. It's it drives me crazy. Now, you think that it's a it's a uh, it's because of the the way that things progress. I mean. Do you think that had you started with the model that finally worked at the beginning, it would have worked? Or do you think that the industry and the community and everything else had shifted to a point where that will work? I think, no, I think if Chef had started with that model from the jump, it would be a public company today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. The reason it's not a public company today is because we didn't start with that model. If we had started with that model, like we'd have continued to build, that community would have continued to thrive the and it still is don't get me wrong progress the people who bought chef chef is still doing great they're making plenty of money their customers are happy like there's not shade on progress but like you know um our ability i think to weather some of the disruptions that happened in chef's business you know we were chef was disrupted way more than most companies are and still grew handsomely quarter over quarter um and and that was the power of that open source part of what we did. Um, that wasn't our commercial monetization being hyper efficient. That was people loved Chef. Human beings who used it, they loved that community. They loved each other. They loved the things that they built. And so even when something disruptive and new came along, they wanted Chef in their lives. They It mattered to them. And it didn't matter to them because of what it did. It mattered to them because of what it represented and what they could do with it. 
And that is what drew that that kept Chef strong far longer than if it had been disrupted as a proprietary product ever would have. And I think nothing about all of that community growth and that that relationship that we had with the people who built the software and then the people who used it, um, all of that would have been even stronger could we have just expressed the truth in the beginning. If we could have just said from the beginning that that's what we wanted and that's what we valued and then tied that concretely into the future of the company's business model, which is what Red Hat has done from the jump, essentially, um, it would have been better. Um, it would have worked. And that we didn't figure it out till late is a real regret. It's interesting. We're, we're, we're actually, I think maybe past time for the end of the show. Um, uh, a, a, a quick question is one that Jonathan often asks, what's the weirdest thing that's been done either with chef or with, um, uh, or with system initiatives that, uh, that, that you've experienced so far. Um, what's the weirdest thing that's been done? The um, most, the most entertaining. <laughs> You know, one of the things that was best about Chef was that um, Chef was very pragmatic and System Initiative is too. And so, you know, we had some people who had used it at a huge entertainment company and they were super excited and they called us up and they were like, come, come look at what we did. We're all, it's so awesome. And so we came to this meeting, which was like, what a lovely thing, right? So we go to this meeting and we're like, can't wait to have them show us this awesome thing that they did. And what they did was just wrote a bunch of Ruby code inside of a chef cookbook they didn't use chef at all really they just wrote a program that did what they wanted and executed it with chef and they were like check it out and it worked they had automated all of their application deployment inside chef by just writing raw ruby um and you know my reaction to it was amazing look at how you solved your problem right like they because they really did like this long-standing problem they just fixed and then i was like let me show you how to use chef to do that <laughs> you know like yeah. maybe you know Maybe you could have done it this way, not that way. Yeah. So it's being out of time, there's yeah. a, we, we always ask two questions to end it up. Um, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Yeah. Well, my favorite text editor is, is now NeoVim. Um, Vim. Uh, and my favorite scripting language, I mean, is Perl. Um, but not the one I use as much anymore, but like yeah. my whole life, rests on the fact that you know larry wall was amazing and the pearl <laughs> community was incredible and they taught me how to program so pearl larry's fun uh <laughs> i'm terrified of meeting him so i have no idea oh really he's a, he's a cool guy I I, seen everyone i know years, who but... knows him i have friends who are like he officiated our wedding larry's great and i'm like yeah, well, I don't yeah ever... he's he comes from the church actually he's a... it's important that i not meet larry wall i'm terrified of meeting larry <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening larry i'm so sorry I'm sure you're a delight. <laughs> and also, I just need you to remain. You may just show up at your house. But you won't know who he is. So say he's somebody. I, I would. <laughs> I would 100% know who he is. I have seen him in person. I've, like He's been across a room from me, you know? Like, we've been in the same spot. And then I turn around and leave. I'm like, mm -mm. <laughs> nope, too much, you know? Like, I, can't do it. You seem very terrifying to me. Anyway, this has been great having you on the show. Um We'll have, we'll have to get you on all the Twitch shows, I think. <laughs> just, yeah, I'll just make the rounds. Pass you around <laughs> to, to all the shows. This has been great. And um, and and good luck with the uh, system initiative. And how that's yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it'll be, you know, and you'll have to come back and tell us how it went after, you know, after. Yeah, 15 years from now, I'll come back and tell you how it well, we could We could probably do it shorter than that. Things happen fast. <laughs> in, in, in we can check world. in along the road, you know. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. So thanks a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. So, Sean. Yeah, in 15 years, earlier Adam's on the back gonna channel, back. You, yeah, he's <laughs> going to come back and he's going to say, what we found is that if we had the core be free, what we ended up doing is having all of the additional things be enterprise. And that just worked so well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the best part of me saying that is I know he's muted in the background still, so he can't even reply. But <laughs> no, that was, it was cool. I'm, you know, so a large part of, uh, gosh, when Chef and Puppet and Ansible and SaltStack and CF Engine and all, basically when DevOps became a thing, a large part of my career was making training for people so that they could, you know, figure it out. And um, it's interesting to hear some of the, the history about uh, Chef and, and stuff because, uh 
that was interesting. And what, what I'm really curious to see is what the system initiative ends up looking like and being in, you know, there's probably, you know, I could probably go and find like, this is what it looks like. And I probably will, because I'm, I'm curious. It, it feels a little bit like uh, a, a next stage of DevOps. And so um, uh, my interest is peaked. Outstanding. I, 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 I've been to see it. She's like, I kind of wish I was a, a DevOps guy. Because I mean, you guys are having fun, know what you're doing. Um, no, that's the, you don't. Know, only, nobody knows what they're doing in DevOps. That's really <laughs> one of the rules. Uh, you just. <laughs> I, and there's just so many, so many things you can do in a, in a lifetime. So, so uh, give us your plugs, your your own plugs. You, oh, I don't really have. You know, I got a new job, so I'm not really doing too much outside of that. Um, uh, yeah, the stuff on the screen there. Uh, my newsletter. Hopefully, I'll. I'll I'll have some issues with that, but yeah, I'm not doing a whole lot uh, outside of just ramping up the new job, which is training. Are you bringing the cartoon back at some point? Is I it hope so. I'm hoping that's like my, uh, my winter time uh, morning entertainment is, is drawing the comic again. I haven't done it in so long, uh, but yeah, I'm getting into a groove. I'm, I'm back to training now. I'm, I'm training on um, Google cloud stuff. So uh, yeah. Fun. Well, I'm glad you're, you're gainfully operating there. Yeah, me too. It's and nice you're... to live indoors and, and eat food. And, things like that. <laughs> and you live up there in the snow belt too. You're not that far from me, actually. You're like 300 miles, two, 300 miles north of here. But yeah, it, you it, don't we, get snow we, here. You we get, get lake there. effect snow and that's the, that's the thing. And it's, it's cold, but it's fine. It's been mild so far. I don't have snow tires on our car yet, which my wife is not thrilled about, but um, we haven't, you know, we haven't needed the snow tires yet. So well, we had to drive somebody to the airport this morning and uh, and the heater went out in the car. Actually, the blower, the, the thing that blows air at you, which might as well be out of heat. So that's what you get with an old Subaru. Those things happen <laughs> anyway. So um, so next week, uh, next week we have and I had it up and yeah, OK, great. It's it's going to be uh, Bradley Kuhn or somebody else from the Software Freedom Conservancy. So that's been planned for a while. We've wanted Bradley on here, but there are a number of people there that are cool. And that's going to be our thing next week. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Adam. And we will see you guys then. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows. Plus, Membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. <laughs>